are thankful for that truth that you are eternal and holy forever. Three in one, a mystery that is at the same time beautiful and true, changes things for us, changes how we relate to you. Thank you for the fact that you alone are unchanging and faithful and trustworthy. Thank you for the amazing gift of assurance that we have through the fully God and fully human Jesus that we are connected to you now and forever, wrapped up into the eternal life of God. Our lives are hidden with God in Christ. What an amazing gift of assurance that is. We thank you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be called your sons and daughters, to be a part of your church in this place. Father, we thank you for the leaders that have been selected from among this congregation who are going to be starting their work soon, the ones who are already serving and the new ones who are going to be stepping in and as we have a retreat next week to begin to prayerfully consider what next steps you want us to take. We ask that you would just continue to guide, lead, mold, and shape us in every way so that we would be the church you want us to be. Lord, we know that we're never going to get it just right. We're never going to be perfect. That's not the point. Father, we want to be faithful to you. We want our hearts to be soft before you, surrendered before you, and listening for the leadership of your spirit. So, Father, we lift that up to you, that work that will be beginning at the retreat next week and the work that will be continued throughout the year by these leaders that have been chosen for such a time as this. And, Father, now we want to take just a moment and pray to you individually about the things happening in our lives or those around us and ask, as always, in your great mercy, you would hear these prayers of your people. Lord, we thank you that you tell us that you do care. You desire for us to ask and seek and knock and that you, like the best representation of a father, know just how to give the good gifts that we need. Your spirit, first of all, to be with us, to be your presence with us, to help us in prayer when our words fail, but also to give us answers that we need and solutions in your time to every part of this world and our lives that has been broken by sin. So Father, we trust you with these things, knowing that in your good timing, you will do what is right and best. We thank you for the gift that we have of being able to bring these things before you. What an honor. What a privilege. Lord, our hearts are full of gratitude and love for you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, I've already said thanks to this team, but thank you so much, worship team, not just for your leadership in these songs, but for your willingness to be here and the tech crew that's helping make this streaming service a possibility. Really appreciate that. And as Michelle said, the, uh, Nathan Essink and Roman and crew who have helped uh, make it so that we could even get here into the building today. We appreciate that. Hey, if there's something we can pray for you about, and you want to let us know, prayers at westwoodchurch.net is a good way to let us know. And the next time we're back in person, if you'd like to pray with someone in person, you can go to our prayer room and an elder would be happy to pray with you. Well, hey, I'm guessing that pretty much everybody listening here knows that there is no pain quite like the pain of having a really bad song stuck in your head that you just cannot get out like endlessly on repeat. And maybe not a bad song, because something that makes a song good actually is that it's memorable and that it sticks with you. But maybe not bad in that sense, but bad in the sense that it's kind of obnoxious to you, that you really wish it weren't in your head, but it is. So for me, actually, um, one of these songs, and please don't ever use this against me, but one of these songs is that old kid's song, Skidamarinkadinkadink, Skidamarinkadoo, you know the song? It comes with actions. I think it goes something like this and something like this, and I don't know where it goes from there, but I don't want to know, because that's the point, is like these things get stuck in your head. Now, 
When I was younger, I used to work with a friend I went to school with, and then we worked together at a company where we did some sandblasting and painting. And uh, throughout the day, uh, you know, we'd be doing various tasks, and because we were around heavy equipment, we'd often have earplugs in, or maybe because it was sandblasting and painting, we'd even have like a sandblasting hood and shroud over us, and so we couldn't hear very well. Um, nonetheless, this one dear, sweet, kind, loving friend that I had knew that this song would just get in my head and it would drive me crazy. And he knew uh, that it was pretty easy to get that song in there. So throughout the day, he would try to get my attention even when we couldn't hear each other. And he would act like there was some pressing manner for work and he'd get my attention. I'd look over and he would just go like this. And he would go like this and he would have this smirk on his face and then he'd go about his business knowing that that song was now stuck in my head probably for hours on end. Well, I'm certainly not going to give you any more uh, information, ammunition on other songs that drive me crazy like that because I'm guessing this one's going to come back to haunt me. But, you know, the thing about that is that the other side of the same coin is also true, isn't it? That sometimes songs can get in our head in a really good way. You know, Music is, is a universal language. It moves us. It can, it can touch us and, and even do kind of a healing work in us in ways that words alone just can't. That's part of why worship music is such an important part of what we do every time we gather for worship. Worship is all that we do with our lives, and in a special way, it's all that we do on a Sunday morning. But worship music has a special place in our rhythm for all of those reasons. Music moves us at a level that, you know, words just can't. And it's no secret that oftentimes music is used as an instrument for memorization. Something that we can, because of the way that it gets stuck in our head, that we carry it with us, that people use to help memorize things. This is true in schools and all kinds of settings. And so with all that, it shouldn't be a big surprise to know that one of the very first Christian worship hymns that we know about was that. It was a teaching tool. It was meant to move and shape and be something that people could bring with them when they left their gatherings of worship, but it was also meant to be a teaching tool. And one of the earliest ones that we have any record of, we have record of because it's actually written here in the Bible in Philippians chapter 2, which is what we're going to read together in just a moment. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 of Philippians chapter 2. And starting in verse 6, verses 6 through 11, is a little passage of scripture known as the Christ hymn. It's something that scholars pretty much universally agree on as one of the very earliest Christian worship songs. And it ended up getting inserted into this letter for a very particular reason. So we're going to talk about all that in the few moments we have after we read this passage. So even though we're at a distance, would you please still stand with me even from home as we read Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. It's the way we engage our bodies and give deference and respect to the scriptures, recognizing their place of authority in our lives as an instrument of God's authority and teaching and shaping. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave or servant and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. And as always, we are thankful for the way that it teaches us, that it reveals 
who you are and more of your truth and will to us. We thank you for the words of this most ancient Christian worship song that show us that in such a powerful and life-changing way where that reality ought to lead us that you have revealed yourself to us in Christ. So we ask that you'd shape us today more and more into the likeness of Jesus who called us, who loved us, who became like us in order to redeem us. In his name we pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, I want to take just a few minutes this morning to, first of all, help us a little bit better understand this dual nature of Jesus, then talk about some of the challenges to the dual nature of Jesus over the years, then the necessity of this belief. And finally, we'll circle back to this song. Why insert this song into this letter to the Philippians? So we'll try to do that in just a few minutes' time. First, let's try to understand a little bit better what does it mean that there is a dual nature of Jesus, that he is fully God and fully human. We claim by faith that when we see Jesus, we see what God is like. We see the fullness of God in human form. Colossians says, we see the visible image of the invisible God. And so the natural question, one that Michelle even kind of brought a little bit this morning, is how exactly does that work? How do these two natures, human and divine, unite? I mean, aren't they a little bit like oil and water? In fact, is that probably how it works? That maybe they're kind of connected and by each other, but they still never really interconnect. Well, over the years, how exactly that works, or the best we can get to how that works, has been decided upon oftentimes when something that was already understood as not being true or accurate or faithful to the Christian faith and the revelation of the scriptures was brought forward, and then that was corrected. So, for example, there have been several ecumenical councils in the first few centuries of Christian faith that helped to clarify beliefs like we talked about last week, the Trinity, but also beliefs like this about how it is that Jesus is fully God and fully human. And that those councils were often convened from Christians from various parts of the Christian world, as far as the Christian message has spread at that time, to help discern together prayerfully how to answer these challenges. So one example was from the Council of Ephesus in AD 431. And, and this actually is a place where they were discussing one of the heresies, which I'll mention in a moment, that had been brought up and how to better understand it using imagery. And one particular leader said, well, maybe it's like two boards, the human board and the God board kind of glued together. And I was pretty quickly struck down and said, no, 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 that's not how it works. That's still two separate halves, not full and full. And so another one of the elders who was at that council said, you know, it's more like this. Think about red hot incandescent iron. Think about a rod of iron that was heated by fire to the point where it's now red and hot. It's taken on the qualities of fire, and yet it's, and in fact, it could start a fire. It has even the heat quality of fire, and yet at the same time, it's still iron. That, it's not perfect, but it's closer than two boards glued together. And then a few decades later, at another ecumenical council, the Council of Chalcedon, this definitive statement was eventually written that called this union, it's a strange word, it's the hypostatic union. You don't have to know what that word means or even remember that word, hypostatic. But here's what it means. The point is, they said, listen, this is not a mixture of divine and human element, elements. He is fully God, fully human, fused together in a mysterious single being. There are not two separate beings. He is fully God, fully human at the same time. A truth revealed through scripture that, like the Trinity, will always remain a little bit of a mystery. And yet to help, help us understand that mystery a little bit better, here's one phrase from what we read a moment ago that many Christian thinkers have tried to highlight down through the years to help us understand it a bit better. It says this, though he was in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God as something to cling to, but instead he gave up his divine privileges. The point is, whenever it was necessary for the eternally existent second person of the Trinity to carry out what he needed to do for us that we couldn't do for ourselves to save us, then he would relinquish the divine privilege that he would have otherwise had at his disposal. It was still there, but he didn't use it. For example, how could it be that God could sleep? How could it be that God could suffer? How could it be that God could die? All of those were kind of wrapped up in what it meant for God to take on humanity to meet us, 
at our point of greatest need and redeem us. And so in those instances, he laid down his divine privileges. So again, this will always remain at least somewhat a mystery, which is why there have been so many challenges to the dual nature of Christ over the course of the centuries. And usually the tendency has been for people to drift more towards one or the other of these natures, to elevate one over the other. So for example, early on in the first few centuries, one example of elevating the human nature over the other, in fact, denying the divinity of Jesus, was something called Arianism. It was brought by a man named Arius, so it was named after him. And it was quickly struck down as not being faithful to the scriptures or the historic Christian faith because it claimed that Jesus was not the co-eternal son, the co-eternal second part of the Godhead. Another example of elevating the other side, elevating the divine nature over the human nature was something called docetism. It comes from a Greek word that means like seems or appears. And so docetism is like seemsism. It seems like Jesus as a divine person and presence was suffering and dying, but that really wasn't true because of course that could never happen to God, right? And so it is interesting that these were some of the very first Christian heresies or false teachings to be corrected, which is noteworthy because there's this instinct away from embracing this mystery for saying, well, see, this couldn't be a fully divine being. That just our rational minds kick against that. He must just be a really, really smart teacher, a good guy who was very holy and died an unfortunate early death or something like that. On the other hand, the belief is, well, God couldn't possibly suffer and die and be humiliated in such a way. That's not what glory looks like. So maybe he wasn't fully divine. And this brings me to want to talk about why this belief is so necessary. The necessity of the dual nature of Jesus. The reason it is necessary that we hold these two together, that Jesus is fully God and fully human, is because that makes him uniquely qualified to connect, to teach, and to save and redeem. If Jesus was not fully God, he would not have any more authority to teach eternal and lasting truth than anybody else would. He would perhaps be a person who had some wisdom, some good things to say, but one to choose from among any other number of potential sources of wisdom and truth and life. And at the same time, if he wasn't fully human, if this was just something written in the clouds, it would not have the power to connect with us, for us to hear it in a way that resonates deeply, that convinces us, that wins us over in its beauty as the word takes on flesh. In a way that softens our heart meets us where we are in an act of love and humility. And if Jesus was not fully God, he would not be able to die as a ransom for our sin. Because part of the result of Jesus being fully God meant that he was both eternal and sinless, which means when he died a death on the cross, he was not receiving the wages of sin that were his own. He was instead a substitution a sacrifice for us, a ransom for us to free us from sin and sin's ultimate consequence of death. And if he were not divine, he would not be qualified to do that. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God. And yet at the same time, if he were not also fully human, he would not be able to meet us in such a way, at the point of suffering and death where we most need it. You see, this is not just a peripheral teaching, kind of an optional add-on, something that we can maybe discard if for us it's distasteful to think of the eternal glory of God descending in such humiliating ways, or if it kicks against our rational thinking about how and this is just a human, he was kind of glorified later, and he was made out to be God. See, if we separate these two, then we lose some of the most important building blocks of our faith, in fact, of our salvation. It is core. It is foundational. It is necessary. But it's also not just like arbitrary and theoretical and theological. And that brings me to the last point. Why would Paul go out of his way to quote this song while he's writing to the Philippians? Well, first of all, I want to talk just a little bit about the situation 
in the Philippian church in the city of Philippi. Now, there was a lot of good going on there. In fact, it's clear if you read the whole letter to the Philippians that these people have a special place in Paul's heart. Some people say that maybe this was his favorite church, and I guess I would say maybe the Ephesian church was too. The, the bond he had with them was no doubt extra special, but I don't really think that that matters. I think he loved and served faithfully all the churches that he, that he had the opportunity to serve and start and continue to teach and correct and guide from a distance. But it is clear he really, really cared about this church, and there was a lot of good things happening. They were some of the first to support him and in his ministry to proclaim the gospel, to share with others who were in need. But there were also some problems that were brewing. There were divisions and factions that were growing. Self-interest was beginning to take root. There were competitions for who was most important and who would get the most recognition, which is why in the lead up to this hymn that he shares, he reminds them, he says, look, if there, you need to be unified. You need to be of one heart and mind. You need to think about others as more important than yourselves, seeking the interests of others, not just yourself. Now, it's also important to know that in the background of all this, the city of Philippi was an important Roman imperial worship center. It was a central place in that region for worship of the emperor as if he were divine. Now, it's undeniable Paul wrote the letter of Philippians while he was in prison. Different people have wondered exactly which imprisonment because this happened to Paul a decent number of times. Many, maybe most even, agree that it was probably written around the year 62 AD while he was in prison in Rome, meaning he was right under the nose of the Roman emperor who himself claimed to be divine. In fact, it says in Philippians, he mentions the imperial guard. That's part of why people think that this is probably when and where it was written. And the emperor at that time was an infamous one named Nero who was ruthless in his persecution of Christians, partially because of his insistence on his own self-exaltation and glorification that he be worshipped and adored and followed unquestioningly. And these Christians who claim that Jesus is Lord were a threat to Caesar is Lord. It was also important to know that Philippi was an important Roman military outpost. And so there were signs of Rome's military might everywhere. In fact, many believed that this was a city where many retired uh, Roman generals and other military leaders would come in their waning days after their service in the Roman military was up. And so, in fact, it's it's likely that, that many of those very people were the ones that were in this church, this community of faith centered around Jesus that met in the city of Philippi, where so much good was happening, but all that was swirling around in the background too which is why it was such a stark contrast to the usual way of the world when Paul reminded them of this, that Jesus was in very nature God. He actually was God, but didn't consider God, or equality with God as something to cling to. But he humbled himself, gave up his divine privileges, and all the rest. And that that was why the hinge turned. That's why his name is the name at which every knee will bow, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is is Lord. The point of quoting that song that those Philippians no doubt knew so well was to remind them that this central belief of faith should lead to humility and servanthood in the lives of Christians and the life of the church as a whole. So with all that in the background, just two quick things as I close. First, this earliest Christian worship hymn stands as the eternal critique of the belief that supposedly righteous or good goals or ends would therefore justify any means to get there. You see, the point is, if the way to defeat evil and death and sin and those who were opposed to God was to simply through brute force trample on everyone and everything that got in the way, then that's what the Messiah, the anointed promised King of God would have done. And yet this hymn points out the complete opposite. Second, this Christian hymn, this earliest Christian hymn stands as a distinctly Christian counter to the usual way of believing and living. Believing that the way to glory and meaning is actually through descent and service, not self-exaltation and competition for prominence. 
It's through humility, not hubris and arrogance. The very fact that God became human, a crucial Christian belief, a building block for so many aspects of our salvation is inseparable from the call to humility and service and sacrificial love. You cannot have one without the other. That's the way of Jesus. It's what he taught. It's what he lived. And it's what he insists that his followers do as well. That's why it's so important to know and hold fast to this, that Jesus is fully God and fully human, that this is what God has always been like at his core. This kind of love and humility and service and selfless sacrifice. And this is why the good news of salvation revealed in the person and work of Jesus changes everything. Having the power to save us and heal this world that God loves. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this amazing gift, this mystery of our faith that you, Lord Jesus, are fully God and fully human. We can get our minds around that a bit, but we trust that it is true where our minds fail us. And most of all, we want to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus as we see the beauty and power of the way that you reveal the glory of God through the path of descent and servanthood, humility, and costly love. Humbling yourself to the point of death, humiliatingly on a cross as a spectacle where you made the powers and principalities who were opposed to you at the spectacle. Through there saying, do your worst, This is what love looks like. This is what glory looks like. And then showed that that was true through the defeat of death and the resurrection. May we keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus. And may we likewise live lives of humble love and service to one another and serving your world that you love in Jesus' name.